Welcome to uh, week 13. Uh, we're going to go over uh, chapter 9, physical security. Uh, let's just see uh, what else is due this week. So, hope everyone had a good weekend. So this week, we have Lab 8, performing a website and database attack by exploiting identified vulnerabilities. You should have some fun with that. And then of course our chapter nine uh, discussion board questions. So it's fairly uh, it, it, easy and interesting uh, week, hopefully. Uh, this chapter is pretty short, um, so um, we'll probably get through the entire chapter today and thus uh, I'll give you Wednesday uh, back to you as well uh, like we did last week uh, and we won't meet on Wednesday um, but I will obviously be available uh, for anyone that has any questions or issues uh, on Wednesday or you know any time during this week obviously uh, but this is a very short chapter, so we'll probably get through it today. Um, so let's go ahead and get through it. We're going to be talking about physical security. Uh, all right. So upon completion, you should be able to discuss the relationship between information security and physical security, right? And then describe key physical security considerations, including uh, fire control and surveillance systems. You know, so a lot of this physical security stuff um, is included in the Security Plus, and it's also good to know um, for overall security. Um, but I, I will admit, you know, um, we're security information information security analysts, uh, cybersecurity analysts. So the, this aspect of the physical security, you know, we just have to have that high level overview. Um, there are experts in these fields uh, uh, for physical security, um, but you, you do need to be aware of, of the physical security at, at, a, at a high level. Um, and then we'll identify critical physical environment considerations uh, for our facilities, including uninterruptible power supplies or UPSs. Uh, so let's go on. So physical security involves protection of physical items, objects, or areas from unauthorized access and misuse. Most technology-based controls can be circumvented if an attacker gains physical access. You now, uh, for the longest time, you know, most uh, Windows and Linux boxes. Um, you could, you could gain access to if you had physical access you, you could crack it very easy um, and get access to it but now uh, some of the physical security on these devices including whole hard drive encryptions and and, and things of that net nature are making it a little more difficult that even but if you have physical access um, it is it is much easier uh, to circumvent uh, security controls. So that's why we have to have a, a, a good overview of, of physical security. Um, well, I'll give you an example. Um, years and years ago, um, when we were first uh, switching over our Novell print servers uh, to Windows print servers, um, I was the lead Analyst for switching the migrate and migrating um, the uh, printers and that over to the new Windows platform, and I got um, a no meeting notice uh, from our payroll department because uh, they had concerns about security uh, regarding the new Windows uh, uh, print servers versus the Novell print servers. And when I got there. Um, you know, obviously, uh, they were concerned about um, at this time that all payroll checks were physical checks. They were printed. You know, they, it wasn't direct deposit at this time for most most people, um, and so they they printed a lot of payroll checks on this printer, um, and they and he was 
wanted me to explain to him the security measures that we had in place and I, I did explain uh, to him that the security that we had in place on the Windows print servers was equal to the security we had in place on the Novell print servers but his real security concern was uh, in my opinion was that his payroll printer wasn't locked up uh, and uh, and it was available and he he asked me well why would that matter if you know you're going through the print server and it's like well I don't have to go through the print server uh, to print these checks and I whipped out my laptop I plugged you know, you know plugged it into the network and then I sent a check uh, to the printer uh, using some DOS commands and uh, printed off a check uh, and told them uh, I didn't use the Novell or Windows server. I had physical access in this room and now I have a check. Uh, and they freaked out, of course, and uh, um, set away uh, uh, plans to uh, lock the room uh, or get a locked room for the printer uh, because that was the biggest security threat uh, for that check printer. Um, so it is important, um, lot, you know, and, and sometimes equally, if not more important than our logical security. Uh, there's seven majors of loss, uh, according to, you know, uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, so extreme temperature, um, gases, liquids, living organisms, projectiles, movement, energy, uh, uh, anomalies, and uh, let's see here, move, movement, yeah. So uh, these seven major sources of physical loss. Uh, and, right, and then energy. Uh, so common roles, you know, we have general management, they're responsible uh, for facility security. IT management and professionals are responsible for the environmental and access security. And information security management and professionals perform risk assessments and implementation reviews. Right, so you're, you're gonna assess the risk, do uh, uh, risk assessments, I did these all the time. And when we brought in new, uh, uh, applications or systems um, and then you also do implementation reviews I, and did this for other projects that I you know I wasn't part of the project team but I was post assessment and do the implementation reviews and check everything out um, to ensure that everything went smooth and, and that it was secure all right physical access controls uh, secure facil facilities, right? You need physical locations with controls and you, know, you need to implement these uh, controls to minimize the risk of attacks from physical threats, right? Um, secure facility or facility can take advantage of natural terrain, um, you know, uh, local traffic flows and surrounding development. Um, and can complement these with protection me mechanisms such as, you know, gates, fences, walls, guards, alarms, dogs, you know, uh, you know, things, things of that nature. Um, some, some of these uh, security controls are listed here on, on the uh, slide here, um, and. Uh, there are a number of physical security controls and issues that organizations and communities of interest should consider together when implementing physical security. And you know, like I said, you know, walls, gates, guards, dogs, ID cards, badges, right, locks and keys, man traps. We'll talk about man traps and what they are. Uh, electronic monitoring, alarms, and alarm systems, and then our uh, wiring closets, computer rooms. Um, than just basic interior walls and doors, right? Um, so yeah, so we'll, yeah, I think everybody knows what walls and guards and dogs are for. Um, ID cards and badges, right? So um, 
having a badge visible, uh, right? We, we got on people uh, constantly, you know, to make sure that they had their badges visible so that you knew that they had the appropriate access and, you know, weren't somebody uh, of concern, uh, you know, that didn't have access. Um, tailgating, right, is when somebody enters in a, a secured facility uh, behind somebody, you know, they have them o open the door. So that's why a lot of uh, companies have gone to the turnstile um, doors where only one, one person can badge in and go through the door at a time. Um, whereas if it was, it's a normal door, you, you badge in, you can hold the door open and, and let others in. Um, and that's called tailgating. Uh, and it's definitely a bad practice. Uh, to allow somebody, you know, some some of the uh, tricks they'll use is they'll be carrying boxes and say, "Hey, can you hold the door open for me?" Um, no, uh, you need to badge in, you know. Um, so let's see here. Then locks and keys. Uh, there's mechanical and electromechanical. Uh, then of course there's manual, programmable, electronic, biometrics. Uh, uh, locks fail and alternative procedures for control and access must be put in place, right? Uh, and locks can fail in a fail safe or fail secure, right? Um, so they, you know, they, f they fail open uh, so that they're safe for, for, for uh, people so that they can get out in case of a fire or they fail secure and they, they, they fail locked, uh, which is possibly not safe uh, if, if it's an access door or something like that that somebody needs to escape in a fire or, or disaster but it's more secure uh, man traps right so the, these are small enclosures um, it has uh, an entry point and an exit point and typically you you uh, have these uh, for example into your data center right so uh, you'll have a, a door that goes into the data center but before that door you'll have a little room um, which usually has a guard um, in that room and then a door into that little room right so you can bat you 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 uh, you badge in uh, to the room then you know then the guards there you may have to sign in um, but the door behind you that you just entered locks um, and then uh, you must have to be able to badge out or badge into the uh, <coughs> uh, data center. And if not, then the guard's going to wonder, you know, you're trapped in there. You can't leave. And then the guard's going to question you as to what you're doing and, you know, do you, do you, are you supposed to have rights uh <coughs> and access? Uh, and so you know, you, you're, you're not, they're not allowed to exit. exit. Once they enter, they're locked in. Um, unless they have access uh, and then you know uh, you're denied entry and then security officials can override the automatic locks uh, you know um, but you know you're gonna have to explain why you're there if you don't have access and it's called a man trap Uh, electronic monitoring equipment can record events, right? So you got cameras, you know, things like of that nature. Uh, um, in areas where other types of physical controls are impractical, right? So you, you may, you know, um, just monitor it with with cameras and, and other uh, uh, surveillance items or uh, uh, infrared, you know, trip. You know, uh, you, you, showing that you entered in in the area or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah. Drawbacks is as passives and recordings are often monitored in real time and and are reviewed at, at a later time. So you may not catch somebody in the act. Uh, and it may be too late, or may, you may not be able to do anything. Damage is already done, right? And then, of course, you can have alarms to notify people, maybe detect fire or detect someone's intrusion. 
it relies sensors that was the words I was looking for right so earlier right so you could have sensors in the area uh, to indicate if somebody's you know uh, walk through a door or, or uh, open a door or entered in an area but you can also get them for you know um, fire and uh, other types you know of sensors yeah uh, gas gas sensors and things like that so um, all, all kinds of different uh, sensors you know, that you can use um, that could set off alarms computer rooms and wiring closets you know they definitely require special attention uh, and uh, you know with, you know, we want to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our information, so we definitely need to make sure uh, the physical access to our wiring, wiring closets is adequate and appropriate uh, to deter people and prevent people uh, from gaining access to your networks. Um, you know, logical access controls can be quickly defeated if they have physical access to the computer equipment. Uh, and then sometimes our custodial staff are the least scrutinized people who have access to offices and, uh, and, and other areas and uh, have a, a great amount of unsupervised access. Um, so you, you definitely need to uh, be careful uh, for in, insider espionage or, or uh, um, uh, retaliation you know disgruntled employees things like that because um, they have physical access uh, which is half the battle uh, interior walls and doors information uh, asset security sometimes uh, can be compromised by improper construction of facilities right so the facilities walls uh, yeah. Um, are, aren't constructed correctly somebody may be able to gain access or you know the doors definitely uh, could you know gain access if they're not set up right you know maybe it's very easy to pick the lock uh, or circumvent the lock uh, and then uh, high security areas must have firewall grade walls to provide physical security against potential intruders and fires. Uh, doors that uh, are providing access to high security rooms should be evaluated and ensure that they are indeed secure. Uh, and to secure doors, install push or crash bars on computer rooms and closets. Uh, so here's Here's an example of someone tailgating, uh, right, following them in. You know, the one person badged in and put in the combination key or whatever, opened the door, and then now the person without access is following in uh, behind them. And then here's just some examples of different types of locks, right? Uh, the one on the left, you know, that is uh, like a programmable mechanical combination lock. Um, I, I really don't like those, uh, but you know, they they are better than no, no lock. Uh, but mo often time, the combination uh, gets passed around and handed around uh, to to people, um, and and so then it's almost like not having a lock. Uh, so. Um, I'm not a real big fan of these uh, locks. Here's an example of the man trap, right? So you go in from the bottom here, right? The hallway, you enter into the man trap area and the door locks once you're in. You, you can't exit without, without uh, uh, having access, right? And so you have the other door, if you don't have access, um, to the inner door, you don't have access to the outer door from within the man trap, and you're trapped in there. And you have to at least notify security to get you out, or so, and in many instances, uh, security is already in there manning uh, at, at the man trap. There's a security guard in the man trap room um, where you do sign ins and that, but uh, it, it depends. Sometimes there's no guard, uh, but oftentimes there's a security guard there. Uh, because it's a highly secure area. 
All right, uh, fire safety, right? So, of course, the most serious threat to safety of people who work in an organization is fire. Uh, fire accounts for more property damage, personal injury, and death than any other threat. And thus, it's imperative that our physical security plans implement strong measures to detect and respond to fires and fire hazards. Uh, we have fire detection and fire suppression uh, you know, systems and so devices installed and maintained to detect and respond to fire uh, or combustible danger. Uh, The flame point is the temp temperature of ignition. And then, you know, some ways to suppress it, right? Deny the environment of temperature, fuel, or oxygen, right? So there are also, there's water systems, carbon dioxide systems, soda acid systems, and gas-based systems, right? So fire detection uh, systems fall into two general categories, manual or automatic. Uh, to prevent attackers from getting at, gaining access into offices during evacuations, programs often designate a person from each air office area to serve as a floor monitor to ensure everybody gets off the floor and, and safely. And there, there are three basic types of fire detections, thermal, smoke, and flame, right? So they, three types of, of fire detection systems. Then fire suppression systems consist of portable, manual, and automatic apparatuses. You know, portable extinguishers are rated by the type of fire, right? So you have class A, B, C, D, and K type fires, and there are different fire extinguishers for each different type of fire uh, uh, fuel that's uh, uh, used on the fire. So class A, is ordinary combustible fuels, uh, so they use water and multipurpose dry chemicals. Uh, class B fires are fueled by combustible liquids or gases such as solvents, gasoline, paint, lacquer, and they use carbon dioxide and dry chemicals and or halon, uh, which you know these are, these can be dangerous uh, uh, for humans, uh, so um, you gotta be careful with them. Um, but they're the best for those types of uh, combustible f fires, right? So then class C uh, is uh, uh, el energized electrical equipment or appliances. So they use carbon dioxide, uh, multi-purpose dry chemical and halon fire extinguishers as well. Class D fires are uh, fueled by combustible material or metals such as magnesium, lithium, and sodium and they use special extinguishing agents and techniques. Uh, and then uh, manual and automatic fire response can include uh, installed systems designed to apply suppressive agents. These are usually either sprinkler or gaseous systems. All sprinkler systems are designed to apply liquid, usually water, to all areas in which a fire has been detected. In sprinkler systems, the organization can implement wet pipe, dry pipe, or pre-action systems and water mist sprinklers are the newest form of sprinkler systems and rely on ultra fine mist instead of traditional shower type systems so making some improvements uh, so gaseous emission systems uh, until recently there were two types carbon dioxide or halon uh, carbon dioxide removes fires oxygen supply and halon is clean but has been classified as an ozone depleting substance so new installations are prohibited um, alternative clean agents uh, presented in uh, table 9-1 found in your text on page 521 uh, uh, are reported to be less effective than halon um, so then this is the water sprinklers uh, go off when the ambient air temperature reaches 140 to 150 degrees and then the liquid filled glass tube uh, breaks and releases the stopper allowing water to hit the diffuser and then spray the water throughout the area. 
system components uh, for the f gaseous fire suppression systems, right? Nozzles, piping, control panels, uh, discharge or warning alarms, hazard warning or caution signs, uh, automatic fire detection devices, manual discharge stations, and storage uh, containers for the uh, extinguishing agent, right? So here's an example of a room that is, you know, uh, set up with fire suppression and, and uh, got the tanks there outside the room uh, that feed the system. Uh, yeah. Failure of supporting utilities and structure collapse. So uh, supporting utilities, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, power, water will have a significant impact on the continued safe operation of a facility, right? Without, well, most of those, uh, you know, your center is not gonna run very long or, or if at all, right? Especially no power, right? Uh, but uh, heating and cooling uh, is just as important. Uh, each utility must be properly managed to prevent provincial damage to information and information systems. HVAC, although traditionally a facility's management responsibility, the operation of the heating, ventilation, and air, air conditioning systems can have dramatic impact on information and information systems, operations, and protection. Specifically, there are four areas within HVAC system that can cause damage to information carrying systems, temperature, filtration, humidity, and static electricity. Temperature computer systems are electronic and are such are subject to damage from extreme temperature. Rapid changes in temperature from hot to cold or from cold to hot can produce condensation, which can create short circuits or otherwise damage systems and components. The optimal temperature for a computing environment and people is between 70 and 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. High humidity levels create condensation problems and low humidity levels can increase the amount of static electricity in the environment. Uh, when condensation comes, the short circuiting of electric, with condensation comes the short circuiting of electrical equipment and the potential for mold and rot in paper-based information storage. Uh, so static electricity also um, is caused by a process called tribal electrification, which occurs when two materials are rubbed or touched and electrons are exchanged, resulting in one object becoming more positively charged and the other neg more negatively charged. When a third object uh, with an opposite charge or ground is encountered, electrons flow again and a spark is produced. One of the leading causes of damage to sensitive security is electrostatic discharge, or ESD. So static discharge is, is no no uh, laughing matter. It, it, it can damage your computer equipment just by your single touch of a, a circuit board or, or um, you know, uh, a piece of equipment. Um, so static integrated circuits, in, integrated circuits in a computer use between two and five volts of electricity. Voltage levels as low as 200 cause microchip damage. Uh, static electricity is not even noticeable to humans until levels approaching 1500 volts. And you can't see the light blue spark until it approaches 4000 volts. A person can generate up to 12,000 volts of static current by walking across a carpet. So, so let's repeat this, right? So anything above 200 volts can easily damage computer equipment. We do not notice a spark until 4,000 volts and we can generate up to 12,000 volts of static just walking across carpet. So you can completely toast computer equipment with static electricity. So it, it, it's, it's serious. Um, two types of failures can result from uh, electrical static discharge damage. Uh, two chips. Immediate failures, also known as catastrophic, ca catastrophic failures, occur right away and are usually totally destructive. 
latent failures or delayed failures can occur weeks or even months after the damage was done. Right? So it's imperative to maintain the optimal level of humidity, which is between 40 and 60% in the computing environment. Humidity levels below this range create static and, and levels above create condensation. So you need to keep it in that sweet spot to, to avoid short circuits from the condensation or uh, cr creating static electricity and sh shorting out the uh, components that way. So uh, ventilation shafts, uh, while ductwork is small in residential buildings and large commercial buildings, it can be large enough for an individual to climb through and, and get go through, right? So the ducts are large. Security can install wire mesh grids at various points to compartmentalize the, uh, the uh, tunnels, right? So, uh, and then power management and conditioning. Right. Power systems used by information processing equipment must be properly installed and correctly grounded. Uh, noise that interferes with the normal 60 hertz cycle can result in inaccurate time clocks or unreliable internal clocks inside CPUs. Uh, grounding ensures the returning flow of current is properly discharged to ground. Um, GFCI, or ground fault circuit interruption uh, uh, circuits uh, are capable of quickly identifying and interrupting the ground fault. And so and an overloading a circuit can create a load exceeding electrical cables rating, increasing the risk of overheating and fire. UPS, uninterruptible, uninterruptible power supplies. Uh, so in case you have power outages, UPSs are a great backup power source for major computer systems. Of course, you also have generators, but you know, UPSs uh, uh, are needed until the generators can kick on. Uh, so basic UPS configurations, you, know, you have standby uh, where it, it's passive and it doesn't do anything until power is lo lost. Uh, line interactive, uh, uh, it's it's feeding through, uh, you know, you're, you're drawing power from it uh, uh, at the same time that it's charging. Uh, standby to online hybrid, uh, standby aerorescent, and then double conversion online and data conversion online. Uh, so there's different, different levels and configurations uh, and you know, obviously pricing uh, goes up with some of these configurations. Emergency shutoff, important aspect of power management is the ability to stop power immediately if the current represents a risk to human or machine safety, and most computer rooms and wiring closets are equipped with an emergency power shutoff. And, but you need to have that physically control, access control, because you don't want anybody just switching off the power to your whole data center. And this is just showing our static discharge uh, Right, so even 40 volts is a high probability of damage to sensitive circuits and transistors. Uh, disk drive data loss at 1500 volts. Uh, uh, May jam printers at 4000, which that's when you can see a spark. Uh, and 2000 is a high probability of a sh system shutdown. And 17,000 causes certain and permanent damage to most all micro circuitry. And this is just uh, depicting uh, the di various U UPS uh, scenarios, right? Um, I'll let you look at that offline, but uh, just different ways to pre you know, prepare in case of a power outage. Water problems, lack of water poses problems to systems, including fire suppression and air conditioning systems. Surplus of water or water pressure poses a real threat, flooding, leaks. Uh, and very important to integrate water detection systems into alarm systems that regulate overall facility operations. Structural, structural collapse. Uh, so unavoidable environmental factors and uh, forces, you know, such as earth, earthquakes, 
can cause failures in structures that house organizations and structures designed and constructed with specific load limits. Overloading these limits result in structural failure and potential injury or loss of life. And thus, periodic inspections by qualified civil engineers um, are needed to help identify potentially dangerous structural conditions. Maintenance of facility systems. Uh, physical security must be constantly documented, evaluated, and tested, just like our, our information systems. Documentation of facilities, configuration, operation, and function should be integrated into disaster recovery plans and standard operating procedures. And testing helps improve the facility's physical security and identify weak points. Interception of data, three methods, direct observation, interception of data transmissions, and electromagnetic interception, right? So the government has developed a TEMPTIS program to reduce risk of electromagnetic radiation monitoring. Security, mobile and portable systems, mobile computing uh, requires more security than typical computing infrastructures on organizations' premises. Uh, many mobile computer systems have co co company information stored within them. Uh, some are configured uh, to facilitate users' access into the organizations and securing computing facilities. So, right, it's securing your mobile network and portable systems is as important as your physical access as well, right, and your information and data. Uh, so uh, we got control support uh, security and, and retrieval of loss of stolen laptops or phones. Uh, you have uh, some copy trace software that would be stored on the laptops and reports to a central monitoring center. Or you have burglar alarms that are made up of PC cards that contains a motion detector. Um, so here is the laptop loaded with a trace software periodically reports the connection and electronic serial number then a monitoring station verifies ownership and status and after reports the theft is, uh, provides information to law enforcement and hopefully they catch whoever stole the, the laptop right that's the idea remote computing uh, so remote uh, site computing involves variety of computing sites outside the organization's main facilities right used for telecommuting uh, or meetings or you know with vendors things like that um, and you can use the internet uh, dial up is not used much anymore but you could uh, or at least point to point lines uh, employees may need to access networks on business trips uh, and they need, need access from home or satellite offices. Um, and of course, telecommuters uh, systems must be made more secure than organization systems because they're going outside the company, right? So you no longer have physical security controls as much over, over them um, and they can be stolen and uh, easily, you know, some, some employees leave them in the car and you know, someone breaks in the car and steals the laptop and they, they have access because once again physical physical access to a system is easy to compromise the system so you know these systems need to be hardened uh, possibly their data most likely nowadays should have their data uh, hard drives encrypted um, maybe multi-factor authentication as well um, just to help make it uh, even more secure Special considerations for physical security threats, uh, develop physical security in-house or outsource, right? You know, you've got the choice. You can do it yourself or you, you have to outsource it. Um, there are many qualified agencies that are available to outsource to, so benefits include gaining experience and knowledge uh, from professionals that do this. You know, that's their, their job. You know, that's all they do. Right, so you get the, the experience of expertise, but the downside is, is it's going to be uh, rather expensive, but it may be, it still may be cheaper than you doing it on your own, especially because one loss could um, 
uh, equal that or higher uh, uh, for the expense so um, and but then you have loss of control and loss uh, and uh, level of trust you must trust that other company if you're, you're having them control your physical security um, so there's a lot of a, bit, a lot of trust being put in place there and then social engineering um, and the use of people skills to obtain information from employees that should not uh, be released or gain access right social engineering uh, is a big issue that's why people are really your weakest link we we've got most of the physical security and information security controls uh, put in place um, but it, it's the the people uh, that can be tricked uh, with social engineering um, that that's probably the organization's weakest link now and then finally of course uh, inventory management is with other organizational resources uh, computing equipment should be inventory and inspected on a regular basis uh, similar classified uh, information uh, should be also be inventoried and managed and then whenever a classified document is reproduced it